Thank you, uh, Casey, and thank you, GoTo, for having me uh, here to speak today. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about security chaos engineering, what that is. Um, since we covered a lot of chaos engineering already, at the GoTo events, I'm going to sort of go right more into security chaos engineering content um, and sort of how we combat the game of security, what I call the security whack-a-mole game. Um, so I'm also so I'm also going to cover a little bit about um, uh, some example uh, S S security chaos experiments. I think Kelly, my my co-author of the O'Reilly report on security chaos engineering, is going to go uh, also into some use cases after this. Uh, but I'm also going to cover um, you know uh, some of the problems that lead up to why this is an important practice. So, like Casey said, I'm the former chief security architect at United Health Group. Um, I also have a background uh, in NASA safety and reliability engineering. I'm a frequent speaker and author in this space. Security whack-a-mole. So um, starting off here, um, really what we're trying to address is, is that um, the, security, the, the security problem is not getting any better. Um, so what, the, what do you see, uh, the slides that um, uh, on, on the, I mean, the, um, the headlines on this slide represent uh, the data breaches and, and, and outages and, and the fact that they're, they keep getting more frequent and become more often. Uh, but the question is, why is this? Uh, why, why is this and why do they keep happening more often? What are we doing wrong? Well, the problem is our systems have fundamentally evolved beyond our human ability to mentally model its behavior. Ah. The speed scale and complexity of modern software has, has made this even more challenging. Things like DevOps, public cloud computing, CI, CD, uh, we're now dealing with systems that change at such a speed uh, and they're so complex and disparate how they operate and interconnect and communicate. It makes it very difficult for us humans to keep, keep track of what's going on at any given point in time. So where does this complexity come from? Well, this, this complexity comes from things, uh, you know, there, there are a couple different areas where complexity comes from, but specifically the, the pieces that we as technologists add to it are, you know, some, some of you see some of these techniques such as cloud computing, service meshes, auto canaries, CICD, microservice architectures. Really with these technologies, they don't just contribute to complexity, they actually directly contribute to our ability to deliver value to customer much faster today. Um, but uh, the problem is that uh, software has officially taken over. And software, the ability to, it's the nature of the changeability of software uh, inherently makes it more complex. Uh, and you'll see over here on the right-hand side uh, that software has taken over the OSI stack. Uh, so I thought that was funny. Um, and it's important to remember, remember that software only ever increases in complexity. Um, there's an old saying in, in, in software that uh, there's no problem in software that can't be solved by another layer of abstraction. But at speed scale, uh, speed and scale, uh, we're starting to see the the the, the um, software start to break. Um, so it's really not about trying to reduce complexity or move it around. It's really about trying to navigate it. And we do that with well, the techniques we've learned that's very viable in doing so. Uh, is with chaos engineering. Chaos engineering allows us to be proactive and try to surface failure so we can learn it and, and develop a culture of being continuously adaptable. It's about, it really becomes about continuous adaptability through continuous verification of our aspects of what we believe the system is supposed to do or what we designed to do and what it's actually reflecting in reality. So I love I love this analogy of the legacy system and and you know I was early on um, in in my journey in chaos engineering uh, I, I overheard a conversation um, about uh, a system that uh, was legacy. This company was a, was a large payment processing company and they uh, they were talking about this legacy system that uh, did all the did all the main transactions for the company. It was the main flagship uh, and the company was concerned moving all that over to Kubernetes. Right, uh, and because uh, under the legacy system, the system barely had an outage. Uh, it was the engineers felt competent; they had the right skills, uh, and they felt confident in the, in the system's operability. But my the question popped up in my head is that was that system always so stable? Were the engineers always so competent? Was it always was that system always so uh, you know was it always that way? And the answer is, is it probably wasn't. 
typically we, we learn to uh, what we didn't know about the system in the form of some sort of surprise, an incident or an outage. And that informs us uh, about the disconnect between what we built it to do and what it actually does. And over time, the engineers feel more confident in, have, uh, in the system's ability uh, to, to be stable through, um, through these unforeseen events. But unfortunately, when you're learning as a result of these kind of surprises, customers are having a bad time. Uh, and with chaos engineering, what we're trying to do is to achieve the same level of stability of a legacy system by proactively surfacing those conditions that typically cause customer pain so we can fix them. Uh, and and um, that's, that's really what it's all about. Uh, and, and where this comes from is the fact that we, we forget that um, a system engineering is a very messy exercise. So in the beginning, we love to think of a system as very simple, right? Uh, there's a plan, there's time, there's resources, uh, and you know, there's our code repository, there's our Docker images, uh, there's staging production, you know, and there's a nice 3D diagram of um, you know, the AWS instance that we're gonna build, right? It's so clear. In reality, our system almost never looks like this. Because uh, after, after a few weeks, a few months, you know, we start to learn about, like I said earlier, our, our, about what we didn't know about the system. Uh, you know, after a week, you know, goes by, um, there's an outage on the payments API, you have to hard code a token. Of course, you go back and fix that after you, uh, after you just, after you hard code it. Um, you know, or the, the day after that, there's an expired certificate. The day after that, there, Google, Google or Bang hires your best engineer, you have to bring someone new into it, or there's an outage on the WAF. We just slowly learn about all the things uh, that um, we, we didn't know about the system through a series of unforeseen events. And uh, this in this this process uh, is um, you know leads to uh, the continuous drift into uh, not understand uh, or the drift into the unknown. Um, so in the end, our systems have become more complex and messy than we remember them. So what does all this stuff have to do with security? I'm getting to it. Well, cybersecurity is a context-dependent discipline. Is that what do I mean by that? So the problem that we're addressing with security chaos engineering or the application of chaos engineering to security is that there's this problem we're having in security is that as a builder, uh, you need the flexibility uh, in the, to change the system rapidly, right? I need to be able to change so I can respond to uh, the market and deliver that value back in, to the customer as soon as I can as a builder. While security is very context dependent. So if you're constantly changing an object or changing something, security must be aware of that object's context and be able to respond to it quickly. What's happening is because of the speed and scale uh, of, these, of these large adaptive systems we're building, it's very hard for the security to constantly keep up with the, the changes that are happening uh, in software. And uh, what and what we're doing with security chaos engineering is we're exposing when that gap occurs by proactively introducing the condition by which we expected the security to function. And by exposing it, we can identify early that the security is no longer as effective as we thought it was, fix it before somebody has an advantage, uh, somebody has the opportunity to take advantage of that, of that gap. Um, and so typically, how do we discover when he's, uh, without security chaos engineering, how do we discover uh, when our security measures fail. Typically, we discover through some sort of uh, security incidents launch, through some sort of alert, some sort of um, you know, a monitoring event, uh, or some sort of footstep in the sand. Well, uh, security incidents are not an effective measure of detection. But at that point, it's already too late. So what happens during a security incident? Well, people freak out. This is also, during a security incident or, or an outage, you know, this is not a good opportunity to learn, right? People aren't concerned about learning. It's about get that thing back up and running. We're losing money because uh, it, it's it's about the business. It's about the business we're trying to protect as well. Uh, and during these conditions, people are worried about being named, blamed, and shamed. And there's, there's no... Um... I heard somebody. Anyway, um, uh, was there a question? Okay. Um, anyway, so during during this during this context, um, uh, people worried about being name blamed and shamed. This is uh, people. Uh, th 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 this is not a good opportunity uh, for people to learn. The chaos engineering. We we do chaos engineering when there is no active incident. There is no active problem. Doing it proactively to try to identify, you know, um, the, the the systemic failures in the system before they manifest into problems. And what's great about doing it proactively is nobody's worried about being blamed or shamed or having caused the incidents. This is a better way to learn because people people have the opportunity to be eyes wide open. 
So chaos engineering, I'm not going to uh, cover the basics of chaos engineering. A lot of people have covered that great uh, um, earlier in the go-to events. I'm going to go kind of sort of go right into it. Um, but I, before I do that, I want to remind folks that there are several books out there from O'Reilly that you can check out. Uh, there's the original book by Casey Rosenthal uh, and the Netflix team. Uh, that was the original report. And then Casey and Nora just released the chaos engineering O'Reilly book. Uh, and Kelly, my co-author and I, who, who's soon to speak right after me, uh, we just released the O'Reilly report on security chaos engineering. There'll be links at the end of this presentation for, for uh, these books. Um, so sec what is security chaos engineering? Well, in the end, it's really just, it's very similar to chaos engineering uh, in general. It's just applied to the security use, security use cases and security context. So um, this wouldn't be a chaos engineering talk if I didn't uh, mention that hope is not an effective strategy. I always like to say that engineers don't believe in two things. We don't believe in hope. And we don't believe in luck. Right? Uh, we believe in data and instrumentation. We believe in what the system tells us is working and is not working. Um, so hope worked in Star Wars, but it doesn't work in engineering. Um, so what we're trying to do with the, the, the application of chaos engineering to security is we're trying to understand um, where the security gaps are in our system proactively before an adversary has an, uh, the uh, opportunity to take advantage of them. So here's some use cases that uh, you can apply chaos engineering for security to. Just there are, there are more than just these four, but these are these are some uh, great ones to start with. Instant response is a great uh, is a great opportunity uh, for for value. Um, I began applying security chaos engineering originally to validate security architecture, so um, that could be also be phrased as security control validation. Um, another great um, uh, another great use case is observability, um, understanding how. Um, how effective your monitoring and alerts are for security controls during uh, security events. Um, because when there's a, when there's an active incident, it's not, people aren't really trying to evaluate the effectiveness or the quality of log data, right? They're, they're trying to piece together what they can to figure out what happened. Uh, and But if you do it proactively, introduce these conditions into the system, you start ascertaining whether or not the security controls and technologies were providing good context and information. Uh, if they weren't, you know, if the, the logs data doesn't make sense, it's an opportunity to go back and tune that and make that better. Uh, um, because more log data doesn't mean it's all good like log data. Uh, and uh, we need to, if the log data doesn't make sense to a human, to use a human, you need to fix it because that's the entire point of it. Um, and the last uh, use case on the slide is compliance monitoring. So every chaos experiment, whether it's security based or not, even if it's perfor performance and availability based, has compliance value. Essentially, you're, uh, you're proving whether the technology or the system worked the way it was supposed to or not, or how, or how you had it documented. Uh, and that's a, uh, that's a great, uh, that's a great um, 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 opportunity for value from an audit and compliance perspective. So don't be throwing away your, your data or your raw data for chaos experiments because they can be used for compliance. Um, so uh, Chaos Slinger was, uh, as Casey mentioned in the intro, uh, this was a tool about three and a half, four years ago uh, that um, a team and I uh, first started applying his work at Netflix uh, and to security. Uh, and we wrote a tool called Chaos, Chaos Slinger. And what it did was, is um, we were sort of, um, we we're transforming to the cloud and to AWS. And we we're trying to um, ensure that the security capabilities that we're building out in our AWS instances were, um, you know, were as effective as we intended them to be. And this really provides us a lot of value and feedback and, and understanding that, you know, what we were doing was working or it didn't or, or where the difference was. So um, a quick example here um, that I'll cover is um, so the main example, if you go to GitHub, you can you can find the repo for Chaos Slinger. Uh, but Chaos Slinger's main example, when we open sourced it, we need a main example that almost everyone could understand, whether you're a firewall engineer, a network engineer, a software engineer, um, you know, we needed something that people could, you know, um, all understand. Uh, and um, so we chose a misconfigured and un or unauthorized port change. For some odd reason, it still happens a lot, even in the cloud, the data center, uh, even though we've been solving for this problem for more than 30 years. Um, so what our assumption was is what if, if a misconfigured or unauthorized port change would happen in our AWS instances, that we would immediately detect and block it, uh, and it would be a non-issue as, as an organization, as a team. Uh, and so we took that assumption, and we built a hypothesis, uh, and we built, we built, 
rebuilt Portslinger, the first experiment for Chaos Slinger. Basically, what it did was uh, is it would pro uh, it would proactively uh, it would uh, sort of randomly select amongst our security groups in our AWS instances for our non-commercial and our commercial software, uh, and it would um, it would select a target uh, um, and it would. Uh, introduce a, a, um, a open or close a, a port that wasn't supposed to be open or closed, and and what we did was uh, uh, so what we expected was is that our firewall would immediately detect and block it. But what we started finding out was that only happened about sixty percent of the time. Uh, so that was a huge finding for us. It was like, whoa, what's going on here? It was actually due to a configuration drift issue between our commercial and our non-commercial environments. So because this was proactive, there was no incident, there was no war room, nobody's freaking out, nobody's worrying about being blamed for an incident. We we're able to proactively, okay, yeah, there's a drift issue here, we need to fix it. So that, that was the first thing we learned and fixed. The second thing was that we, uh, our, our configuration, our cloud native configuration management tool caught the change and blocked it every time. So something we were barely paying for, barely even knew that was working or, or would do that um, was, was 100% effective. So that was, that was great. Um, and uh, so that was the second thing we learned. So it helped, it helped us build confidence in that. Uh, the third thing we learned was is that, so we expected um, uh, log data to come from the firewall tool and from the configuration management tool uh, to correlate event, uh, you know, to our security, in our security um, centralized logging solution. And that actually worked. I actually didn't have a whole lot of confidence that that would actually throw an alert, but uh, it, it did. Uh, and and that, that was great. So the, the our security operations center got alerted uh, that, um, uh, when that happened. Uh, but the problem was, is when the, the, the operations center analyst got the alert, they couldn't tell which AWS instance it came from. And, and as, an, as an engineer, you can think to, uh, you think to yourself, you can think that, well, I could just map back the IP address. Well, when you map back the IP address, I mean, that could take 15 minutes or that could take three hours, depending upon whether SNAT is in play. Um, but we did, you know, uh, um, and also it's important to remember, this is the largest healthcare company in the world. Had this been a had this been a a, a, um, a real outage or, or incident, this would have been very expensive uh, outage. Uh, but there was no outage, there was no incident. We were proactively able to learn that all we had to do was add metadata to the pointer, uh, and it was a non-issue. Um, but these are some of the things we learned through doing this. Um, but um, but there's a variety of different experiments that are that are being done today, and I think uh, we're going to hear more about that from from Kelly and some of the other speakers on security chaos engineering. But um, I want to encourage everyone, uh, if you're looking for more information on sort of how to do security chaos engineering, if you're looking for uh, more uh, how Capital One or Cardinal Health is doing chaos engineering and their stories, um, you can find that all in the, um, the Security Chaos Engineering O'Reilly Report that was just released. And you can get a free copy at verica.io slash SCE book. Thank you very much.